Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration is recorded for us in Matthew's Gospel, the 21st chapter, beginning with the 28th verse, where Jesus confronts the chief priests and elders of the people, saying, What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. He came to the second and said the same thing. The second answered, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, The first. And Jesus said to them, Amen, I tell you. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, but you did not believe him. However, the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. Even when you saw this, you did not change your mind and believe him. This is the gospel of our Lord. In the name of Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed, it is said that actions speak louder than words. It's one thing to say you're going to do something, but it's a whole another thing to, to actually do it. If we don't do what we say, well, our words mean nothing. It was now Tuesday of Holy Week, and for some time now Jesus' enemies, the, the chief priests and elders of the people, have been ramping up their efforts to try to catch Jesus saying or, or doing something that would get him into trouble with the authorities or to discredit him with the people. And so using a brief parable, well, Jesus exposes the unbelief and, and the hypocrisy of these religious leaders. Jesus said, a man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered, I will not. Wow. This first son, he, he just flat out refuses to do what his father told him. It was as if he was saying, well, I don't care what you want me to do. I'm, I'm going to do what I want. But then we're told that later he changed his mind and went. He regretted what he had earlier said to his father. And so he goes and he works in the vineyard. The father came to the second son and, and said the same thing. Son, go work in my vineyard. And the second son answered, I will go, sir. But he did not go. The second son, he, he said the right thing. He even called his father, sir. But when it came to actually doing what he said he would do, well, there was no follow-through on his part. Jesus then asked the chief priests and the elders of the people, which of the two did the will of his father? Now, this, this wasn't a trick question. No, the answer was obvious. And, and they said to him, the first. It is interesting to note that these chief priests and elders had no problem applying the answer to Jesus' question with the characters in Jesus' parable. But when it came to applying the parable in their own lives, well, they refused to consider the possibility that, well, that they might be that second son, the one who, who said all the right things but didn't actually do what he said. And so Jesus then makes it very clear to the chief priests and elders that, well, that he was speaking to them. Jesus said, Amen, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Can you imagine how shocking Jesus' words must have been for these religious leaders to hear? And they couldn't understand how, how that could even be possible. Why would such obvious sinners like tax collectors and prostitutes be more deserving than they were? Well, Jesus tells them why. He said, for John came to you in the way of righteousness, but you did not believe him. John had preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but they wouldn't listen. They refused to believe that John when, when he pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus goes on to say, however, the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. Tax collectors and prostitutes who heard and believed John's message 
Well, they repented of their sins and, and they looked to Jesus for forgiveness. They even produced fruit in keeping with repentance. They showed with their lives the change that had taken place in their hearts. No longer did they want to continue in their life of sin. No longer did the tax collectors cheat the people and, and the prostitutes sell their bodies for money. But even that wasn't enough to convince Jesus' enemies that John was preaching the way of righteousness. Well, the chief priests and elders of the people, they, they still refused to believe John's message. And Jesus says to them, even when you saw this, you did not change your mind and believe him. And just as these religious leaders had earlier rejected John, well, now they were rejecting Jesus. They refused to believe Jesus was the promised Messiah, the Savior from sin. By all outward appearances, well, they seemed to be religious, but their words and their actions, well, it betrayed the unbelief that was in their hearts. And so Jesus asks the question, which of the two sons did the will of his father? How about us? Which of the two sons are we like? Are we doing the will of the Father? And, and what is the Father's will? Well, the Apostle Paul wrote, God our Savior wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And Peter wrote, The Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God earnestly desires our salvation. He wants us to repent of our sins. He wants us to know and to believe the truth of what Jesus has done to save us. And at times, well, we can be like that second son. We too can be quick with an, oh, I will go, sir, as we express our willingness to do what the Father wants, only to fail to follow through on what we said we would do. For example, think of the many confirmands who have stood before this altar on their confirmation day and have promised to remain faithful even to the point of death to the one true God. And yet, sadly, what so often happens? Well, think back to the members of your own confirmation class. How many are still actively involved with the church? The sad reality is that all too many have wandered away from the faith. They have stopped coming to church to hear God's word proclaimed and, and to receive the Lord's Supper. Private Bible study is non-existent. They've become spiritually lazy and complacent. They've forgotten the promises that they made before God's altar. But even more tragically, they've forgotten the gracious and loving promises that God has made to them in his word. Now, I've been saying they, but don't these things perhaps describe some of us at one time or another in our lives? Well, sometimes we have good intentions. We want to be more faithful in worship, in Bible study, in our personal devotional and prayer life. But despite our good intentions, how often doesn't it happen that well, we don't follow through on them? And so easy for us to make excuses, isn't it? We say things like, well, I can't do it because I have to work, or, or my kids have activities, or, well, I'm just too busy. And like the second son, well, there can be some hypocrisy in all of us. We might express our desire to do what our Heavenly Father wants, but when it comes to actually doing it, so often we fall short in our efforts. That's why there needs to be some of the first son in all of us, the one who, who changed his mind. All of us by nature are sinful. Now, that's not something that we like to hear, but, but it's the truth. Day after day, again and again, in our thoughts, words, and actions, we fail to live as God would have us live. We don't always love God or our neighbor the way we should. We've done evil. we failed to do what is good. We confess with the Apostle Paul, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. And so we too need to repent. Repentance begins with confessing our sins to God. Like the first son in Jesus' parable, when we change our mind about sin. We regret the sins that we've done. 
We have sincere sorrow over them, and we wish that we'd never done them. And we feel this way not, not because we got caught or because maybe someone was hurt by what we did. No, we repent because we recognize that in committing those sins that well, we've disobeyed God. We're sorry for that. We acknowledge that because of our sins, we deserve God's wrath and to have him punish us eternally in hell. And then, like the tax collectors and prostitutes who listened to and believed John the Baptist when he spoke to them about the way of righteousness, and so also we listen to and, and we believe the one who says that I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we lay our sins at the foot of Jesus' cross and, and we cling to him alone for the forgiveness, that forgiveness that he won for us by his perfect life that he lived in our place and by his innocent suffering and death on the cross for us. That forgiveness, that includes forgiveness for all of our empty words, all of our misplaced priorities, our forgotten promises and our neglected intentions. Because his forgiveness comes to us through Jesus, we know that it is sure and certain. Repentance, it shows itself in changed actions. The tax collectors and prostitutes who believe John's message, they didn't continue in their life of sin. They no, they no longer lived for themselves, but, but for him who gave his life for them. And so also we, in love and gratitude for all that the Father has done for us in, in sending Jesus to be our Savior, we strive to carry out our Heavenly Father's will in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. See what God wants? Well, that's what I want. We strive to follow through on our intentions and our promises to be more faithful in worship and Bible study and, and to share that good news of sins forgiven in Jesus with our friends and family. This is doing our Father's will. And through faith in Jesus, we readily confess our sins, not with empty words, but with repentant actions. But in order for any of this to happen, well, we need to remember that there's also a third son in this parable. He's not mentioned specifically, but he's the one who, who's doing the talking. Jesus is the one who came to fulfill all righteousness. He's the one who carried out his father's will perfectly. He's the one who in the Garden of Gethsemane expressed his full intention to do what his father wanted when he prayed, not my will, but yours be done. Not only was it his intention, Jesus actually carried out his father's will to save sinners all the way to the cross where he cried out, it is finished. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in this brief parable of Jesus, we see some striking contrasts. We see a son who, who refused to serve but, but later changes his mind and goes. And then we see a son who says all the right things but doesn't walk the talk. We confess that we are often some strange combination of those two sons. Our words are often empty and and we often reject our Father's commands by our sinful living. But we also repent of our sins and, and confess our faith in Jesus as the perfect third Son who has forgiven all of our sins and who empowers us to live for the glory of God. Through faith in Jesus, we want to be a, a little like each of those two sons, but in a good way. Like the second son, well, we want to readily do what the Father wants with good intentions and an expressed purpose. And like the first son, we want to follow through on them with repentant actions that show that our words aren't empty. Through faith in Jesus, we can do the Father's will because, well, Jesus already did the Father's will for us. And to him be all praise and glory. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.